this is the 18th of the mystery series that I'm going to be sharing. Um, last week I shared on the Melchizedek mystery. Who of you were blessed? Were you blessed? Great, great. Um, this is the 18th. I'm not going to tell you what it's about yet. But why I started this is sometimes I think we've, well, now I know we've gone through a very hard time. And sometimes we start to question, and I think some people were shaken to the core of their being in the last two years, right? And I think when you look into the mysteries and you just, it, and they expose to you and they reveal to you, it brings such an incredible excitement in your heart thinking, wow, this can only be God. And it brings a confirmation that truly God is who he says he is. Hence, I've been sharing on this. And uh, I obviously cannot work out your salvation with fear and trembling. My calling is to, for prayer and the ministry of the word, according to what the Bible says. Hello. hello. Not according to tra 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 tradition says I must drink tea and coffee. And that's nice. But that's not my mandate. That's not my calling. My first and primary calling is to pray in the ministry of the word. And I'm going to try and dispense the ministry of the word in a way that brings such excitement and vibrance in your heart that it, that, that fire is ignited once again. And uh, I can pray for you, but the rest is up to you. Okay, I cannot do more than that. You need to work out your salvation. And what God plants in your heart today, I want to encourage you every day. What it, take that and run with it. Do not let it stay there. That he may encourage you and finish the great work that he's begun within your life. Amen. Now, who's the greatest man ever to be born? No, second to Jesus, sorry. Who is the greatest man ever to be born second to Jesus? Sorry? No. No, that, that was in the Old Testament. Okay? He was the most incredible man. Who is the greatest man that was ever born? In the Bible. In the world. But according to the Bible, you'll see it in there. Come on. Answers. Hello? David? Solomon, Paul, come on guys, what's the answer? Hey, Adam, who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no, we knew, but in any case, I wish. <laughs> come on, who's the greatest? Sorry? Abraham, Adam. Okay, it's in the New Testament, how's that? He's an incredibly well-known character, yet there's not that much known about him. Or the most important part is not known. Not Paul. Sorry? Not James. Sorry, someone said? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. My Konyani word. Well done. Sonia. It was so super cool, I, I, I put that on our family ch chat, on our family, intimate family, my family and my extended family. You know, my brother, sister, those, and that, the kids and that. And I said, who the greatest? That's what I'm sharing on. And guess what? My brother-in-law, my sister's wife, boom, hit it on the nail on the head. He says the... Uh, Jesus said John the Baptist, but I think it is Moses. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to laugh because he hit it on the head the first time. I asked my mom last night and she guessed second, the, the second thing, name she guessed. First she said Paul, then she said John. But that was encouraging. So, let's have a read. Matthew 11, verse 11 to 24. I tell you the truth, Jesus speaking, okay? Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Who? No one greater than John the Baptist. Listen to what it says here. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Who is least in the kingdom of heaven? 
Jesus. Hence he was greater than him. But we won't get into that now. Verse 12. From, that day, from, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. Verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has an ear, let him hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We play the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not, did not mourn. Verse 18, For God came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, He is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. It's funny how no matter what you do, you're going to get a critic. Okay? But I'm not going to get into that. But, in, but here, if you go and look into this, his name is Yohanim. Okay? John the Baptist. Just interesting. One of the coolest things about John is that he was the last prophet. Okay? He was the last prophet of the Old Covenant. But he was also the first prophet of the new covenant. How cool is that? But let's not get distracted because let me share on what's important. Now we need to understand that Aaron was the first priest that was appointed under the law. Okay? I've shared with you that so you all know that. Aaron was appointed first priest under the law. And the priest was known as as the Kohenin. Okay? And what was the priest's role? Come on. They had to. They, they had to do all the things in the temple. And they had to recognize that this lamb was acceptable, pure, and as acceptable as a sacrifice. And then they would have to do the sacrifice, etc. Right? So that was part of the job of the Kohenin or the priest. Okay? Very important that you understand this. Now, the sacrifice took place for what reason? Why was a sacrifice offered? So that people could come back into right relationship with God. So that they could be forgiven of their sins. That was the purpose of the sacrifice. But it had to be a sacrifice that was pure, without blemish. That had to be a perfect sacrifice. And who was the one to, to identify and say this is acceptable, the sacrifice? The priest. Okay? Now, Jesus comes on the scene and uh, he comes on the scene and he's supposed to be the once and all, the one and only, the one that is to come and uh, f be the final and complete sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. But who is going to ratify, who is going to identify him and say, this is the final sacrifice? It had to be a priest, right? Who was going to be that priest? Who was going to be that person that would say, this is the final sacrifice? We know now it had to be someone that was from the priestly line of Aaron. Obviously, now you know that John came from the priestly line of Aaron. However, he did not just come from the priestly line of Aaron from his mother's side. He also came from the priestly line of his father's side. How super cool is that? He was a pure-blooded priest. Wow, God is amazing. God is super cool. If that doesn't blow your mind, <coughs> here we go. Luke 1 verse 5 to 7 says, In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly line of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. There you go, both lines from the line of Aaron. He was a pure-blooded priest. 
Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. God ensures that Elizabeth and old Zechariah do not have a child till the appointed time. Because everything with God works on a appointed time. Perfect timing with God. And six months before the, Jesus is conceived, who is conceived? John the Baptist. And we can go into those, all those little things of leaping in the womb and you know, all of those. those. The amazing thing is that God ensures that this barren woman conceives and is, comes from, it, it comes from both lines, from Aaron, priestly lines. And John is conceived and he's born six months before Jesus. And his prime role and purpose in life was what? To prepare the way of the Lord. Hence Jesus says he's the greatest among men to be born. But why? Why? Matthew 3 verse 1 to 3 it says, In those day, days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judah. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And here old David, I mean, what's his name? John is born. And he prepares the way of the Lord. And he goes and, he's, and he, he baptizes people for repentance. And he's preparing the way of the Lord and he's been a faithful uh, priest but also an incredible prophet of God. And he was fulfilling his role. Now, what was the role of a priest? The certification of a sacrifice. That was one of the major roles. And when you understand that, the puzzles start falling into place. An incredible thing takes place. And Jesus, John is busy ministering and then suddenly he says, and he looks and he says, Look, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And he certifies that Jesus is the final and complete, perfect sacrifice. Boom! Hence Jesus could be crucified and be the final sacrifice. But it had to be identified and certified by a priest. Yet you get a priest from a pure bloodline and he says, Behold, have you, some of you wondered, why did Jesus say, Behold the Lamb of God? That's why. He identified him and he said, This, I give my approval. This is the Lamb. Have you ever seen that? How cool is that? How clever is God? It had to take place. There had to be a certification that came from a priest, and here we have it. Hence, Christ Jesus could come as the final and complete sacrifice. Because all the sacrifices in the Old Testament never pleased God. It was a shadow of that which was to come. It had to be a pure, perfect sacrifice. But it was a temporary forgiveness. This, Jesus comes and he is coming as the full and final, perfect sacrifice. The Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth, says the Bible. How incredible is God. John played and had, had an incredibly important role and he fulfilled his role perfectly. Now, one of the, <sighs> one of the sad things is that John was such a man of stature and integrity as that we read earlier, his parents were. He had awesome role models. 
And here he was a godly man, incredible man. And he speaks out against injustices and immorality that was play, taking place via the king. And what did King Herod then do? Because he spoke up against him. He put him in jail. How is that fair? He speaks the truth and he gets put in chuki. Is that right? Would you have done that? Would you have been willing to do that? Would you have been willing to do that? Speak the truth. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Most of the church today are, you must be careful what I say, most of the church are petrified to speak the truth. We have become accustomed to being politically correct and it is sickening to the core of my being. I cannot be that way. And I refuse to be. Why? Because you're too chicken to be put in jail. And be persecuted. For standing up for the truth. How cowardly are we? And much of the church is like that today. I've been warned many times. People come to me and say, hey, you better be careful what you say. Watch out here. No? Sorry. If the truth hurts, suck it up. Jesus offended many people. But the church has become so politically correct, we become irrelevant. And John speaks the truth. And what happens? Herod goes and puts him in jail. Why? For speaking the truth. How sick is that? And that's why the church has been bulldozed today. Because we want to be not transformed by the renewing of God and his word and his kingdom and his way of doing things, we are transformed by the ways of this world and be politically correcting. It is sick. Listen to this. Mark 6, verse 21. Finally, the opportunity, opportune time, time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughters of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I will give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Sure. Super cool, eh? Who of we would have jumped to half of the kingdom? Verse 24, she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. Why? Because she was offended that John had spoken against what she had done. Verse 25, at once the girl hurried to the king with a request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. John the Baptist's head on a platter and on this side, half my kingdom, which in today's terms would have been literally billions. Which would you have chosen? <sighs> the king was greatly distressed. But because, because he liked actually John. Because he knew he was a priest and a prophet of God. But because of his oath and his dinner's guests, he did not want to refuse her. Rather please the world than God. So he immediately sent an executioner with the orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in prison and brought back, uh, brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Can you believe this young <sighs> savage girl? Uh, sorry, this young lady would make that choice. I remember I need to be politically correct. Was she a savage? I mean, come on. It is savage to ask the head of someone on a platter. I mean, are you insane? But in this day and age, we have to be politically correct and say, this young lady. Why can't we speak the truth? But in any case... 
it is just ridiculous. And she makes this sick request, and she she asks of this of who a godly man that had done nothing wrong. What do you think of that, church? Do you think that's fair? Do you think that's right? Do you think God should have allowed it? Hello? Do you think God does allow that, even in this day and age? <clears throat> Hence, belief systems that propagate that everything will go well and you'll never have hard times and you'll never go through difficulty is not an honest, truthful doctrine. And the problem is, much of the church is fed rubbish when it comes to doctrines that they believe that and when tough times come, their faith crumbles. May our faith not crumble no matter what happens and what we go through in life. Matthew 11 verse 2 to 6. When, listen to this. Now John, John is a godly man. He's a priest of God. Okay, He's, He comes from the line of Aaron. Okay, He's a pure-blooded priest. He recognizes Jesus is the Messiah. He recognized that he's the final sacrifice. Godly man. Okay, then we read here. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should I expect someone else? <laughs> what the heck? Why do you think he said that? Why do you think he said that? He said that because he had picked up a fence in his heart because God, Jesus didn't come and drink tea with him in prison. Hello? Like much of the church, that you don't come and drink tea with, I'm leaving, I'm not coming to this church anymore. And he, he had picked up a fence in his heart because here he prepares the way, he, he does everything for the Messiah. I mean, that's what his life was about, preparing the way for King Jesus. And here he's doing what is right, Gets chucked into prison and Jesus does not even go once and see him in prison. Yet the Bible says you should see those in prison. But Jesus doesn't go once. And he picks up a fence and he says, are you truly the one? Yeah. Did, he, did you think he doubted that Jesus was the one? No, he knew he was the one. He even said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He knew that. But yeah, he says it. And listen to what Jesus says. Jesus re replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cursed. The deaf hear. Cured, sorry. The deaf hear and the dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Blessed are those of you that are not offended by me not doing things the way you expect me to do them. And I say the same. Blessed are you if <laughs> you are you, you, you're not... I don't come and drink tea with you every day. I... I and I'm, and I'm serious because that's what Jesus was saying here. Blessed are you that do not stumble in your walk with God because I don't do things the way you expect me to do them. And many people I've heard, yeah, but God this and God doesn't do this for me and this, therefore, I, ah, this is not for me. Come on. Remember, God is gone. And he doesn't always do things the way we expect him to do it. God is God and he thinks he's God, so never forget that. And you think he must come in the front door and remember what Joe says, sometimes he comes in the back door. And that is God. And he has the right to do that. Now God said, Jesus, Jesus said he is the greatest born of woman. 
Then it says, then he carries on and says, Yet he who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So can you be greater than John the Baptist? Can you be greater than John the Baptist? How? By being least in the kingdom of God. The problem is we want, we want the fame and all of this. There are some of you that might be incredibly faithful just in prayer. Because that's your mandate, that's your mantle, that's your calling in life. Is to pray for the saints. And to pray for this or for that. And you're faithful in it. You might be least. And you might be totally unrecognized. But you could be greater than John. Jesus was least in the kingdom of heaven. That's why I believe he's the greatest of all. And all of you always say him first, so in a sense you're right. Who of you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who of you want to be greater than John? Then we need to become least. But many of us want to be up there and have all the recognition in the world. Are you willing to lay down your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? John the Baptist's whole life was about preparing the way of the, the Lord. And he, he was incredibly faithful in that. He was an amazing prophet of God. So much so that Jesus said, this is the greatest man ever to be born. Yet even he... When the time came, he picked up a fence in his heart. And every single one of us can do that. But I want to encourage you, don't do it. Don't allow it. Don't allow a fence to, be, to ever grab hold of your heart. Towards God, towards one another, don't allow anyone to be a stumbling block. Because it is so, so easy for that to happen. Your mandate and your calling is different to mine. And my mandate is different to yours. And may we learn to honor the mandate, the mental, the calling upon each other's lives. And may you be found faithful to the calling of God upon your life. And may I be faithful to the calling I have upon my life. Because that's what God expects at the end of the day. And are you willing to to be faithful to that, irrespective of the cost. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Then it says, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Jesus is certified as the perfect lamb. John says, behold the lamb. And he was faithful in his calling. And Jesus was faithful even to death. I want to encourage you as a church. I don't know what each and every one of you are going through. Some of you are do, some of you are done. Some of you are going through different, different things than what the person next to you is. The issue is not what you're going through. The issue is what you're allowing God to do through you in what you're going through. He loves us so much, he does not want us to stay where we're at, but he wants us to become more like him. And that should be our goal, not to get to heaven, to become more Christ-like, to become more like him. And your mandate is crucially important to this world. Every single one of us. But are you going to be found faithful? irrespective of what you're going through. 
And I'm sorry to say, but God allows us to go through hard times to shift us so that the chaff in our life can be removed. But will we still hold on to the hem of his garment and not waver? May we praise God, may we praise Jesus for being willing to come and to become the full and final perfect sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. We can live in relationship with God once again because of that. And we can know that he's the final complete sacrifice because he was confirmed as the perfect spotless Lamb by a priest, John the Baptist. How incredible is that? May we serve God and may we never waver no matter what happens in our life ever again. May we cling on to him and even if it's to death, may we not be politically correct. May we speak the truth in love and may we stand up and not get bulldozed as a church any longer. Because the church at large has been bulldozed. Because Satan has an agenda. And let me tell you, his agenda is forcefully advancing. But so can the churches, if we will stand up and take hold of the mantle, the calling upon our lives. Amen.